Dietrich was accused of murdering his girlfriend, Nicole Vanderheiden, in May. Her body was found in Bellevue. You know, when Doug kept trying to call her back, and he kept going straight to voicemail. Douglas Dietrich was released from jail earlier today because of lack of evidence. I left Doug's house with the police officers to meet them here. This video contains an interview with a man whose best friend is suspected of murder. In May 2016, when Greg Mathu agreed to go out to a concert with friends, he had no way of knowing that he would end up entangled in a murder investigation. His longtime friend, Doug Dietrich, and Dietrich's girlfriend, Nicole Vander Hayden, had hired a babysitter for the night, and after the concert, the group decided to go out drinking. Mathu and Detry separated from the others, which bothered Vander Hayden as the night went on. After several angry texts and phone calls, she stormed out of the bar. That was the last time her friends saw her live. The next morning, the badly beaten body of a woman was found in a field, wearing nothing but a pair of socks and a pink wristband. The cause of death was ligature strangulation and blunt force trauma to the head. Instantly, the detectives turned their focus on Detry, positive that he was responsible. And all of our friends have been for, you know, Aaron. and the one that got me off, and then, you know, we've all been friends since high school. Okay. Do you have a best friend? I mean, probably Dustin Clark. Okay. So why? never. It's, I mean, Doug is a close friend, though. Close friend, but not a best friend. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, our group has been together forever, you know, we've all mm. went in ebbs and flows and hang out with one person more yep. than another, you know. How often would you say you hang out with Doug? Twice a month, maybe. Okay. You know, I'll go over to his house, see him and Nikki and the kids and hang out for a while, play some ping mm. pong, you know. And I don't okay. drink that much because I had two OWIs, so I'm trying to grow to go out and drink. Okay. So, would you, who is Doug's best friend? I mean, probably Brian Everett's. Brian Everett's is Doug's best friend? Probably, I mean, it just. Why would you say that? I don't know, I mean, they just, they hang out a lot, they go golfing, they golf together. So, if you had to guess, you'd say. Brian Everett's best friend. Brian's probably his best friend, but Brian's married, he lives in Sheboygan, you know, mm -hmm. so. Who would be his closest best friend in the area? I don't know. Me or Dustin. You or Dustin Clark? Yeah. How often do you talk to him on the phone or text him on Facebook? I mean, you guys twice a week. I mean, I don't know, you know, something interesting or something mm -hmm. funny, you know. I mean, I guess I don't text out all that often. It's so not a daily thing, though. No. Definitely not. No. Okay. I mean, until the last three days, I mean... Why so... Why would it change now? Well, the because of how days. crazy the last three days have been. I mean, what the fuck is going on? I mean, that's with the text in bed, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, when we were going to the Steel Panther concert, I obviously was texting him because he was going, you know, he was going to go there with Nikki. So, you know, I let mm -hmm. him know that we were... You know, going to the Steel Panther. Okay. Who all went to Steel Panther? I mean, there was a big group of us. Um, Aaron Klimsky. Aaron Klimsky, Crystal Kane, um, Scott Peterson, Darcy Lipsky, Aaron's fiance, um, Jesse Collar showed up later, Mike Gillespie. Angela Cormier. Um, I mean, our friend Katie Jones. Her her husband was opening for Steel Panther. He's the lead singer of Annex, so she was there. I was excited to see her because I hadn't seen her since she got married. The detectives are trying to determine how close Matu is to Detry, or if there would be someone else who would know the state of the relationship between Detry and Vander Hayden. Are a lot of these people friends with both of you? I mean, yeah, I mean, it was a group that we were all friends with, we were all drinking buddies. I don't see a lot of those people as often anymore because I don't, you know, very regularly go out to drink. Okay. Because of the problems of <laughs> OWIs. Okay. So, run me through the night of Steel Panther. What, uh, yeah. What's all going down at the water and all the sand lot or whatever? Man, it's a great time. Everybody's having a lot of fun, you know. We got we all parked in like that back rugby court, you know, the rugby field back there. 
you know, we didn't know where we were going to park when we got there, and then, they, you know, they actually had a huge place for us to park, and we were having a great time. I mean, it was fun. I was talking to Katie, catching up with her, because I hadn't seen her in a long time. You know, I mean, I was talking to Nikki for a while, you know, and just everybody was having a great time. And then, you know, 11 o'clock rolled around, the concert ended, everybody's kind of shuffling around. And I guess they left, and Nikki went with them, which was weird because, she, you know, she doesn't really know those guys that great. Like, she's probably met them two or three times and you know, this entire time. So I, me and Doug, like, are on our way out, and we see a friend from high school that we haven't seen mm -hmm. for a long time. And we start talking to her and talking to her husband and, like, we lose track of time a little bit. And, I mean, during this time, I guess Doug's getting, you know, phone calls from Nikki. And finally I was like, all right, we got to go, you know, like, I'm going to go get my car. I'm going to drive it up here and then, you know, mm -hmm. come out. So, I mean, it probably was, I don't know. 12, 15, 12, 20, that, like, I got my car, I pulled it up, I told him, like, you know, I sent him a text, I said, get the fuck outside, you know, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he came outside and got in my car, and Nikki was calling him, you know, yelling at him, telling him she's leaving, because she was at, she's at the sardine can with our friends. And Did you hear this conversation? Vander Hayden was angry that Detry wasn't with her at the bar, and her anger only increased when he answered someone else's call rather than hers. This video shows a desperate escape attempt by a criminal who had successfully concealed a weapon, which he then turns on police while still under arrest. You can watch it right now, plus many more Patreon exclusive videos for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash stranger stories plus. I mean, I could hear him being like, you know, just go back to the sardine can, go back to the sardine can, what are you doing? Go back to the sardine can, I'm like that. And then she must have hung up, and he called her back, and they're arguing again for a while, you know, of him trying to tell her. Are you guys driving that I, way? At this point, I'm driving. And then, so, I pulled on to North Platten, because I used to live on North Platten with a friend of ours. And I pulled into his driveway just to be off the road, and I'm like, Doug, hand me the phone, let me talk to her, maybe I can calm her down. Maybe I can get her to tell me where she is so we can go and pick her up. And Do you have a pretty good relationship with Nikki? Yeah, I mean, we're friends. I okay. like Nikki. You mm -hmm. know, she's a great mother to my irresponsible friend's child, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, so I talked to her. I tried to calm her down. I'm like, just let me know where you are. I'll come and pick you up, mm -hmm. you know. Why and do you think you could talk to her over well, because they're like she's mad at him and they're like are you know what they're arguing out. about her like running off into the street you know mm -hmm. i mean he wasn't like yelling at her mad he's yelling at her like don't be stupid go back to the sardine can what the hell are you doing you know mm -hmm. we're on our way right now we're on our way i'm sorry mm -hmm. I, did, I wasn't there you know that i mean that was like the gist of the conversation but i could tell that he just had to keep repeating the same thing so i knew she did you know so I, I was like, give me the phone, and I pulled it into his driveway and parked. Mm -hmm. And I took the phone, and I'm like, Nikki, it's Greg, you know, calm down. I'm, we're on our way right now. I've, I'll come and pick you up, you know, or go back and start eating can. And she wasn't making any sense. She was like, this is Doug. You're pretending not to, you're pretending to be Greg. This isn't Greg. I know this is Doug. And I'm like, Nikki, it is me. And then she either hung up or her phone battery died. I don't know what happened, but then somebody came to the door at that house, and it wasn't, you know, my friend. Like, I guess my friend sold his house. <laughs> I have in the driveway? The, in the driveway, I was. So I was like, well, shit. What you was know, the address on Platten? Uh, 1253 North Platten is where I parked. It was like a, a young girl, like, opened the door, mm -hmm. and then I was like, well, shit, you know. Who this, had been living there? Josh Andrews. He had gotten married, and we knew when he got married that we were never going to see him again yeah. because his girlfriend hated us and <laughs> did, you know, only was being nice to us at that yeah. time. To I got friends this way. I know. And so, I mean, we were all joking that night. Everybody's like, anybody talked to Josh lately? And they're like, yep, haven't talked to him since we were in a wedding. Yeah. So you didn't even know that he hadn't lived there before. I didn't know that he sold his house. One of my friends said that he had a for sale sign in front of his house, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that his house was sold. And, like, a, I mean, 
it looked like a young black girl like opened the door and was looking out and was like, oh shit, you know. So then I got back on the road and you know I cut up and down a couple roads around that way just to see if I would see her. And we thought maybe she went back to the sardine can, so we went back to the sardine can and we stayed there. I talked to some people. Just you and Doug in the car. Me and Doug, yeah. By the time we get back to the sardine can, all of our friends have left. Okay. No one's there. And you know this? Um, did you? Because you have been talking to your friends. No, no. We when inside? we showed up there and walked around, well, we went to the tiki bar area and we walked into the tiki bar area. Where did you guys park at when you got there? I parked by the bank. By the BMO Harris, right next door. Yeah, so I mean, like around that corner, I was parked right there. Okay, so you're there. Yeah. And then you go. You walk in yep, around which it. Which entrance did you and Doug go in? We walked into the Tiki Bar entrance. Together. Yes. Both of you. I mean, I believe. Yes. I mean, yeah. I Close think we so walked right into the bar area, and I was out smoking a cigarette in the Tiki Bar. Okay. So at this point, you knew that she, Nikki, had had run away or yeah. whatever. But she had done this. This was the last time any of her friends saw Vander Hayden. Previous times, okay. Prior, to this, this was not something that was that unreal. <sighs> she gets like delusions of grandeur. She's like, I'm tough. I can walk. I can. I'll walk all the way home. I was from Denmark. She yeah. tried to run away during the Packers Arizona game, and it was okay. like 30 below, and her jacket was in my car, and I was at a friend's house. I was sober, and I was like, I will come and pick you guys up whenever you need me to pick you up. And Doug sends me a text, and he's in the back of a cop car, haha. And I'm like, what in the fuck is going on? Like, you know that I'm here. I'm a mile away. I can pick you up. So is this behavior that Nikki does when it's drunk? Drink. I mean, I've only drank with her two times. Times, You know, okay. I've only ever drank with her twice. It was that, and then this night. But Doug had said one other night they were out, and she ran off, and she ended up at a friend's house. But you know, and then she came back home. You know, that next day. Okay. This seems to be a pattern of behavior for Vander Hayden, and it is most likely the reason why no one was concerned that she did not come home during the night. It would have been reasonable to assume that she went to a friend's house until she had time to cool down. So then run me through what happens next. You guys arrive at the, you so park at the Vimeo Harris, you guys go inside. We park there, we go inside, and Doug's mad, you know, he's like, oh, she's being stupid, you know, what the fuck, and he wants to drink, and I, I'm like, we did a shot at the bar, like he was harassing like the bartender inside. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have his wallet on him, or he did, you know, he left his wallet in my car, he didn't have any money on him or something, and the bartender's just like, give me five bucks, and you can have these stupid shots. We took the shots, and then I'm like, yeah, I gave five dollars to the bartender. So I went back, and I... I started to talk to some of the people out there. I'm like, hey, have you seen, you know, have you seen a blonde girl? And the first guy's like, is her name Nikki? And I'm like, yeah, it is. But the way Nikki is, I could see her going up to somebody and say like, hey, what's your name? Mm -hmm. I'm Nikki, you know? So he knew who she was, you know, which was kind of weird. But then I asked another guy, I'm like, hey, you know, have you seen her? Has she come back? And he's like, yeah, I saw her, you know, she had left earlier. And then I talked to that guy for a while. That's the guy, I guess his name was Max, that they had that they had talked to. And then, I mean, I don't know at what point we left. You know, it was probably 2, 2.15. So you guys, on your way there, drove around looking for her yes. a little bit, couldn't find her, went there, and then stayed until last call. Well, I don't know. They didn't, like, tell us to leave at all at that point. But the Max guy, when we were about to leave, he was like, you know, I just want to let you know, man, there's this thing going on tonight, so, you know, be careful if you're driving. So then I'm like, well, shit, you know, I don't want to be driving all around these streets. I mean, I don't know that I was, like, over the limit, but, I, I, you know, I quit drinking at, like, 10 until I took that shot at, at, uh, at the sardine can. So what's the conversation so, between you and Doug at this point? As at this point, you know, I'm like, they're doing a, a DUI thing tonight. You know, I guess there are cops everywhere pulling people over. So I, you know, I'm like, I'll drive up and down a couple streets. So I drove up and down a little bit, you know, and once I saw Gray Street, because I lived in that area, I knew Gray Street took you to Atkinson. Mm -hmm. So I got to Gray Street, I took a right, you know, I got to Atkinson, I got on the highway, you know, went over Tower Drive Bridge, mm -hmm. you know, went straight there, got to Doug's house probably at 2.45, mm -hmm. 
I went, we went inside, we talked to Dallas, the babysitter. Where did you park at, Doug's? In his driveway. In the driveway? Yes. Okay. We went and we talked to Dallas, the babysitter. Any other vehicles there? Her, her vehicle was there, Dallas's. Okay. So we went and talked to her and she's good friends with Nikki. The babysitter would later testify that Detry told her, I don't know, she hit her head and she just wanted to walk home. So she called Nikki and Doug called Nikki, but Nikki's phone was dead from the time that I last talked to her. You know, Doug kept trying to call her back and he kept going straight to voicemail. I tried calling her, went straight to voicemail, I mean, on his phone. And so, you know, they did more of the same, just straight to voicemail. I stood around with them for a little while and I'm like, you know, I'm gonna Where were you guys at in the house when this was going on? In the kitchen. Well, me and him were in the kitchen and she was like sitting on the couch you know, she was sleeping, but you know, by the time we got there, so. Where was the baby? I don't, I don't know if the baby was in like the little carrier. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming that's where the baby was. I, you know, it was dark in there. She had the lights off because she was sleeping, you know, and then they had okay. like, and like the dim lights on in the, in the kitchen area. And he, you know, continued to keep calling and, you know, I said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to head out. So I left. Dallas was still there when I left. I drove straight home. I got to my house. I went. I brushed my teeth. I mean, I, I remember. Which way did you drive home? I took Monroe all the way to, you know, right past the sheriff's office to the highway. I jumped on the highway. I got off at JJ. I, you know, I took a left off of the highway on the what Old Manitowoc Road is that what it, you know what it'd be called? I took a left by Lou's One Stop, mm -hmm. straight down there to my house. Brush my teeth. I played five games of Candy Crush on my mom's Kindle for okay. her, and then I my phone it was dead at that point because I was trying to take video at the con you know at the concert. So I plugged my phone in, and you know it popped back on at 3:31, and then two texts from Aaron came through you know saying like I tried to stop her you know. She was too pig, you know, because Doug's a friend, but she was too pig-headed, mm. and she kept, she ran off, you know. Okay. So I got those two texts that I didn't see them that night. I fell asleep before my phone actually charged up enough. And then I got up in the morning. I texted a friend of mine. I said, hey, you know, you want to go, you go to Brilliant to go Frisbee golfing because she works uh, Dustin Clark for night shift. Mm. So, but he, I didn't know if he worked that night, but he didn't go to the concert, so I thought maybe he was working that night. So I texted him to see if he wanted to go to Brilliant. He he told me, or he didn't text me anything back at the time. I was all, What time did you text us to clerk? Probably like 8.03, 8.05. Usually that's when he would get done with work, get home, you know. Has to go. Be ready. That's usually what time. you remember what the text said exactly? I, it just said brilliant question mark. Brilliant question mark. Yes. And you, you guys obviously both know that to mean go for the Yes. Yes. Be a brilliant question mark. You want a question mark. You know, these okay. different places that we usually go. And so then, then what, what happened? So I got up and I think I played some more Candy Crush and I told my mom that I was going frisbee golfing and I went to the Mason Street Casino. And I what time was that? I probably I probably left my house at nine nine fifteen. I got there by nine thirty. I sat around. I won a little bit of money. I was doing pretty good for a while. <laughs> I got a pack of cigarettes and just smoking cigarettes in a place you could still smoke indoors. Uh -huh. I did you use your player's card when you were? No, there? I did not. But I mean, you know, they should have. They have cameras everywhere. You'd think that they would have cameras. I I don't have a player's card because I don't want anything coming to my house being like, oh, you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're, my parents would not like, you know, knowing that I'm fucking going to the stupid casino. Mm -hmm. So I sat there for a while and at like, I only know this because of the text at 11.04, I texted my friend who lives close to the casino. He's kind of a hoarder, you know, I go there once in a while, I'll clean his house or I'll bring him food, he dr you know, he drinks and he's just a little guy, so I try to bring him food. So I texted him like, are you hungry, you know, hungry yet, question mark, and he didn't send me anything back. I went to Burger King, I went to his house, he always leaves it unlocked for me. Which I let out friend? Marcus Mandola, he was on Oak Ridge, which is like off the military a little bit. I went to his house, I ate half of my Burger King, I, you know, I got, I got two rodeo burgers, two crispy chickens, and a 10-piece chicken nugget. Mm -hmm. You know, I ate the 10-piece chicken nugget <laughs> because he didn't wake up. I ate the rodeo burger and the crispy chicken, and he was passed out the whole time. 
I took the bag, I put it in his refrigerator, mm -hmm. I let his dogs out, you know, I smoked some cigarettes, and then I got into my car to leave, and that's when Doug sent me a Facebook message saying that he couldn't find his, uh, that he couldn't find his phone. Matthew is very open and forthcoming, giving the detectives as much detail as possible. He has no idea that they suspect him of playing a part in Vander Hayden's death. What time was that up? I mean, I know when I talked to the cops originally, I didn't know, what, you know, exactly what the timeline was. Yeah, it's all good. So I know I told him it was earlier, but it was like 12.37, I think, when I looked back at the first time that he had texted me. It was 12.37. Saying that he didn't have his phone, I sent him a Facebook message back saying, I was at your house in your kitchen. He, well, he asked, is my phone in your car? That's what he had mm -hmm. asked me. And I said, uh, no, your phone's in your house. I saw you calling the key in your kitchen, so I know your phone's in your house. Mm -hmm. So I went home from Marcus's house probably at about, you know, at that 1247. I was in my car when he sent me that. So then I was like, I was like feeling around my car for a little while just to see it. I'm like, no, wait, I saw you, you know, using your phone in the kitchen, so it cannot be in my car. Mm -hmm. So he said, I looked for my phone, I can't find it, I thought maybe it was in the couch, I don't know where it is. And I was like, well, I'll keep looking because it wouldn't be anywhere else besides your house, you know. So I got home, well, I, I, on my way home, I called my dad because my dad wanted me to go at some point today and meet him at our storage garage and, and uh, put a coat, they were going to switch out the truck that my mom drives in winter for their convertible that she drives mm -hmm. in the summer, right? And he wanted to put this couch that my sister was getting rid of that they were just saving for me on top of the truck, <laughs> but he didn't want my mom to know this. So I called him to see if he wanted to meet, us, meet me there, but he was out mowing the lawn, so he didn't answer. So I got home, and then he wanted to go right away, and I was kind of mad, I'm like, Jesus, you know, I, like, I just walked in the door, and like, sit down and relax for a minute. And so he wanted to go right away, and so I jumped in his truck, we drove over to the storage garage, we put the couch on top of the truck, and then we came back to, to our house. I went, I was going to take a nap, you know, because I didn't sleep much the night before, but I was awake and ready to go for frisbee golfing. We did that, and uh, so I took like a, a nap for like two hours, and when I woke up, I saw that Doug had texted me, he had texted me, what's up, and I, that night before, I told him, you know, I'll give you a ride back to your car at the watering hole, you know, whenever, just let me know. So, I called, you know, and, but we were still, I was like, is Nikki back, you know, we had sent texts back and forth, like, you know, is Nikki back yet, have you found Nikki, you know, and he'd be like, no, I still can't find her, I can't find my phone, but... This, you know, this was a little later, so I think it was 2.47 that he had texted me about, about coming, you know, just like hitting me with a text. And then at about 4 is when I actually texted him back, saying, you know, what's up, you need a ride? And he said, yeah, give me a call. And then I called him, and he had said that, you know, he was going to file a missing persons report. While it wasn't unusual for Vander Hayden to stay away while she was mad, she wouldn't have left her infant behind for an extended length of time. Without receiving any contact from her by morning, Detry was right to be worried. And I was like, yeah, you know, you probably should. You know, by, by noon, her not getting home was, you know, getting scary because she fucking loves that kid. There's no way that she wouldn't come back to that child. So he called me again. And I was on my way, and he's like, well, the police are going to come over here. They said it won't take very long to get here, you know, so if you don't want to come here right now, you know, I'll call you when it's done. And I was like, well, I'm already on my way. You know, if I can help, I'll come, you know, if I can help with the timeline because he was pretty drunk, you know, that night. So I ended up getting there. His parents were there. Where did you drive there? I took the exact same way, you know, that I took home. I, 43, yeah, I got on the highway right there, I came around, Monroe. Yep, Monroe, and then straight down to his house. So I got there, and his parents are there, and I've known, you know, I've known his parents for a long time. I worked, you know, when I was in college, I would go and help his mom with stuff, you know, she'd put a lot of Christmas lights up or help her with landscaping because they have a big yard, you know, so I would work there in the summers while I was in school, or I mean, in the 
in the school year, you know, whenever I could. So I know them very well, you know, they're both great people that I've always really, you know, loved being around. So I talked to them for a while and we're just like, you know, in shock, like what in the hell is going on? And then about probably two or three minutes later, the police showed up. <coughs> Excuse me. The police showed up and, you know, that's when we so started. So there, it's Doug. And his, his mom, mom and dad, dad. Because they were going to watch Dylan while I brought Doug to get his car. Okay. So he called them to come and watch, you know, Dylan while I brought him to his car. Okay. So then what happened next? I mean, then the investigators came and, you know, we tried to, well, Doug was telling, like, the timeline of that night, and I knew his timeline was off, but I'm like, you know, I don't want to just keep interrupting and be like, well, no, this is what happened, this is what happened. So then when... What was off about his timeline? Well, like, he thought we were only at the watering hole for, like, 10 or 15 minutes before we left to go and meet them, and I knew it was more like 30 or 45 minutes, probably, you mm -hmm. know, before we went, but I didn't want to just keep, like, interrupting them and change, you know. So we were looking, you know... At the time, we thought that we were looking for her yet and trying to, you know, and realize at that point that two hours earlier that they had found a body, you know. So they thought we were really trying to help actually find her and give the best possible way to find her. So they found a body. Well, they found it at 2 p.m., right? I mean, I, okay, so when the police came, two more officers came. And they're like, you want to follow us down and just give us your... Police were aware of a body of a female that had been found before they received Detry's call. The body was in such bad condition at that time, no ID could be made. You know, events. I'm like, of course. You know, I think my timeline is more accurate than Doug. She was hammered. You know, he might not know the time, the different times as well as I did, I felt. You know, so when I got here, one of my friends had texted me and said, like you know, what's going on, and I'm like, well, I'm in the police station right now, you know, being questioned, and, you know, it's crazy, and he sent me a text back, like, well, they found a body at 2 p.m. today, and then... When did you at, first hear about at 10 o'clock, 9.47, I think, right, it was about a minute before they took my phone to, you know, run through my phone, and then, I mean, then it was real and scary that... I wasn't here just trying to help out. I'm not understanding. I must. Uh, what do you mean? So you drive. This is at this is at ten, like ten o'clock at night when I've been talking to the office. I okay. I left Doug's house with the police officers to meet them here mm -hmm. to give you know my events at probably mm -hmm. I mean seven o'clock maybe six thirty, and then I you know I was sitting here with them from that you know at that Please. time, but, but then at you know they're asking me to consent to giving them my cell phone, I'm like, yes, you can look at all the stuff, and that, you think that's going to help, and then that buddy of mine sent me that text, and I'm like, well, what the fuck, you what know, buddy? Uh, Dustin had sent me a text. So Dustin, what's Dustin's last name, Clark, yes. sends you a text at what time? Like 9.47, it was about a minute, like they took my phone from me, like the next minute, like I already signed my consent form to, mm -hmm. for them to search my phone. So that, as you turned your phone over and signed the consent form, just a minute prior to that is the first. Like a minute. I mean, he wrote down the time that he took my phone. I would mm -hmm. bet if you look at that text, which they should have, you know, they should mm -hmm. have that text, that it was like one minute later after, the, you know, that he had told me that. And then why would why would a body be Nikki, though? I, because she would never leave her kid. She would come home to breastfeed that kid. She was so big on taking care of that child. I mean, by 4 o'clock, we were terrified. Whenever anyone goes missing, their natural reaction upon hearing that a body is found is to worry that it might be their loved one. This holds especially true when little to no physical description is given. So you don't find out? You find out I found out at 10 o'clock, and then a friend of mine, that Katie that was at the concert, the next morning told me that a friend of hers at a at a cookout had said that the person that they found had a had a steel panther bracelet on her hand. I mean it's the most unbelievable unbelievable thing you can ever fucking imagine. So as we sit here today you believe that, that body is Nikki then? I mean when I heard that there was a Steel Panther concert 
bracelet on her arm and we have a friend that's missing that would never ever abandon her child for any reason. I mean, she's the greatest mom you could ever imagine. When I heard that... How did you hear that she had a steel panther bracelet on her arm? From Katie Jones. Katie Jones? Yes. And I believe, I believe Doug may have mentioned that too. And Katie Jones mentioned that to Doug? No, she mentioned that to me when I was about to come back here to pick up my car the next day. So Katie Jones mentions that to you. When you, what day was this, and at what time? This is when I was here to pick up my car the next day. So this is now Sunday. Yeah, Sunday at probably eleven. Eleven in the morning. Yes. So you're coming here to pick up your Buick. Yeah. And that's when you hear that there's a steel Panther Panther bracelet, bracelet on, on the girl. On the girl. And you heard that from Katie Jones? Yes. And Katie Jones heard it from? A police officer that was at the scene, I guess. You, you said Katie Jones or Doug or Ann Doug? I mean, I had talked to Doug at like 10.20 he had called just saying like how insane this is. 10.20? In the morning. Before I came, um, like right when I woke, I woke up to my phone ringing. I mean... Ten, Not that I slept about? well in the first place in the morning the next yet. Yeah, on Saturday, Sunday, Sunday morning or Sunday no, morning? No, this was Sunday morning. So Sunday morning at 10.20? He had made, I, I, I mean, you know, it's so crazy what is happening right now. I'm not... What about Saturday? How many times did you talk to Doug Saturday? On the phone, I didn't talk to him at all. There was no phone conversation was between you or him? Until I was on my way to his house, yes, to pick him up to get his car. That's the only time that there was any conversation, and it was How long him, was that conversation? I mean, you think? A minute. And what, you know, was it, what happened in that conversation? That conversation was him, you know, saying that he's going to file a missing persons report. You know, if I want to come by now, I can. If... You know, you want to wait until after the missing persons report is done. You can come then. Mm -hmm. I said I'm already on my way. I'll, I, you know, I'll come now. Maybe I can help. Okay. What about the original Facebook message when he was looking for his phone? What's that? You were talking about a Facebook message. Yeah. The first one I got was at 12:37. I sent him a message back saying, you know, it's not my car. I know it's in your house. I saw it. And, you know, I saw you calling in the kitchen. He sent me a message back. Still can't find my phone. Still can't find Nikki. Like what the fuck, something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I sent, I think I sent him another message back saying, you know, your phone is in your house somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. you gotta find it. And then I think the next message I got was from his cell phone saying, found my phone, what's up, you know, at like 2:47. And then that's one at like four I responded to mm -hmm. saying, you need a ride to your car. Okay. What was Nikki wearing that night? I mean. The only reason, like, I mean, I know she was wearing dark clothes, but the only reason I know was because I was standing in the room with Doug when he told them what she was wearing, you know. It made, it, yeah, when he said it, I was like, yeah, it might have been, like, a silver and black striped, like, not low cut, you know, it wasn't like a cleavage shirt, but, like, mm -hmm. kind of low hanging shirt, and he said she was wearing black capris, and I mean, I guess, I, you know, she had black pants on and all. Remember what kind of shoes she was I mean, wearing? No, I mean, they keep asking about the shoes, but I mean, I know what he said she was wearing for shoes. You know that they were like silver medium heels, but I mean, I never looked down at her feet and thought, you know, oh, those are cool shoes. You know, right, right, right. So, what can you describe? Anything specific about her? Like what she looked like, her hair styles? I, mean, I think it was just kind of like, kind of just straight wavy, maybe. I mean, you know what kind of phone she has? No, not really. No type of purse she had? No, I mean, I know my friends had said that she did have a purse, but I didn't remember ever seeing her. I mean, we're at a concert. Why would you mm -hmm. want to have a purse on your arm when you're, like, okay. kind of jumping around and, you know, dancing or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't remember ever seeing her purse, but... What kind of phone do you have? An iPhone 4. An iPhone 4. Do you... Is it you under your name? Yes. So you have through Sprint. Through, through Sprint? I mean, if you want to get any of the telephone, you know, conversations, I'd be more than willing to, you know, if Sprint can do that, I'd be more than willing to allow you to, you know, go through any of those conversations. Okay. What, uh, how long have you had this specific phone? Long, I mean, a while. 
I've been my otter box broke and I've been waiting for the phone to break so that I could go and get my upgrade, but I just have it, you know, I just have them, so I probably had the phone for four years. Okay. Does anyone else ever use your phone? No. Has anyone ever used your phone? I mean not that I know of. I have a lock on the phone, you mm -hmm. know. What about you know, Friday night and a Saturday? Was it in your pocket or in your hand? I mean, it died on Friday night at some point. I don't know at what exact point in the night mm -hmm. when my phone died, but yeah, there would be no reason that anybody would have my phone. Okay. I mean, so I don't think. It was on your person? I mean, yes, it was. I got home and it was on me. Okay. I plugged What's it in. What's the code for your phone? 0816. The detectives are focusing pretty hard on Matthew, even though they have no evidence against him. Only his relationship with Detry has drawn their attention, as well as the fact that he came forward with information. What was the last text or call or thing you did on your phone? I mean, I, I don't even, that night, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, if, I mean, the last thing I might have saw on my phone was Aaron had texted me from Darcy's phone because his phone died too. Well, on what time? I'm not 100% sure. Before we left the watering hole. Before you left the watering hole? Yeah, because he had texted, this is Darcy's phone, you know, he texted, this is Darcy's phone, we're, we're at the starting can, you know, where you guys yep. at. And you have a car charger? No, I don't. You have no car charger? No, I do not. Okay. So you had no way to charge it in your... No, I first was able to charge it when I got home that night and plugged it in. So you're saying after leaving the, or before leaving the watering hole, that's when you were still using your phone, you never used your phone after leaving the watering hole? I'm not 100% sure. I think I texted Crystal where they were at, I might have texted when I got to the sardine can, I might have texted Crystal, where did you guys go? Mm -hmm. And that she sent me a text back saying, I don't even know what bar it was. But I may, I, I might have used it at the sardine can, but at some point, you know, around that time, it did die. Okay. You know, since my partner Zach and I have never met you, uh, it's difficult for us to judge where somebody's telling us the truth or a lie, right? So, uh, there's no secrets here. I'll let you in on some of our secrets. A lot of times, what we'll do is we'll ask questions that we already have answers to. Okay. Yeah. We're trying to determine if you're if you're really truly trying to, to help us, or if, or if, or if there's something amiss, you know. And just because something's amiss doesn't mean you did anything wrong. You know what I mean? It means it could mean that you may be scared or something else or or whatever. For example, you may be you may be trying to cover up one thing that we don't care about. For example, like say drunk driving or something. When we're really interested in in knowing something else. All right. So having said that. You know, when you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory, right? You don't have to memorize stuff if it's, no. you're just recalling things. So let's let's try this. Let's try. We talked about Friday. We talked about Saturday. Let's try something more recent. Let's try Sunday night. Okay. What did you do Sunday night? It should be last night into the day. So Sunday, I mean, we're all in a whirlwind. The police are contacting everybody. I went over to my friend Marcus's house again, and I was sitting there, and he was at playing bean bags at Badger Badger State. And I called him, and he didn't call. He didn't respond. I was sitting there with his, you know, with his dogs. I let his dogs out in the backyard, and I was smoking a cigarette. And he called me back, and I was just like, you know, you would not believe the ins insane last. 36 hours of my life, you know, like, what the fuck is happening? And he asked me, you know, you, you need me to come there? And I said, yeah, you know, we come here. And so I was, we were sitting there and we were talking just about how crazy all this stuff was. Even though the detectives have implied that they believe he is lying, Matthew still doesn't realize that he should ask for legal representation. He knows he is being honest and thinks this will be enough to keep him out of jail. And then I got a text from uh, Aaron Kalinske just letting me know that they were at Crystal's and that, you know, be good to be around people right now and not, you know, losing our minds. And so I sat at Marcus's for a while. And then at that point, I, I you know, I said, you know, maybe I should just go to Crystal and Mike's and see those guys. So I went over to Crystal and Mike's 
and I stayed there for a while, and we talked and just, you know, talked about how crazy all this stuff is. And then from there, I went back to my parents' house to talk to them, just make sure that they knew I was all right, you know, because of all this stuff that's going on. And so I talked to them for a while, and then I went back over to Mike and Crystal's. I got a pack of cigarettes, and I got a pack of cigarettes for Crystal. And then Dougie called me, and we were talking again about how crazy all this stuff was, and like that the police had released his house back to him. And I said, you know, if you need a ride there, you know, he'd been talking about going back there to get his contact solution and get some changes of clothes. I said, you know, you probably should stay with your family right now. You probably should go back to the house, you know. So I said, let me know if, you know, if you need a ride there. I, I went to Aaron's house and he said that he was just beat and he was going to go to bed. So I drove back to Marcus's house and I texted Doug, I'm like, you know, if you need a ride today or tomorrow, let me know, you know, and hang in there. And he had texted me back that him and his dad went back to the house and got contact solution and clothes. And then I left Marcus's house at probably 10.30, 11 o'clock at night and went back home and went to bed. So just to confirm you, you didn't spend any time with Doug last night? I haven't seen Doug since we were in in his kitchen with the interview with the police officers for the missing persons. I haven't seen him since, no. Okay. And does Doug, does Doug have a drug problem? I mean... What's his drug of choice? I mean, he smokes pot. I mean, alcohol is his drug of okay. choice. Alcohol, you know, what else? I mean, you're, you're his best friend. I, I mean, weed. I mean, he smokes pot. Right. You said weed. You said alcohol. You're his best friend from, since high school. So if he did have a drug problem, you would know it, okay? And I want you to remember back to, I'm going to ask you certain questions that may be difficult, but I'm going to judge how you are at answering those questions when I know the answer, but they're difficult for you to answer for me, okay? They're going to, they're going to get progressively more difficult. So what is his drug of choice besides weed? And alcohol. I mean, occasionally he might have a little cocaine, occasionally. Okay. You know, maybe three or four times a year on special occasions. I sure. mean, I I don't know any pill that he does. He keeps that stuff private. Doug is a pretty private person. Okay. But I mean, that I don't know any other drug. I, I have some concerns that I really don't. I, I have some concerns that it took me a couple of questions to get to a simple thing like cocaine. Well, it's only very rarely. I, I mean, that's why I wouldn't say it's his drug of choice. You know, pot something that he might smoke a little more often, and alcohol is something that he does far more often than the other, you know, so it's your drug, drug of choice? choice. What's your drug of choice? I mean, I, 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 told you I enjoy taking Adderall once in a while because I don't drink much anymore. I like to listen to science and technology podcasts, and it makes, you know, me pull that information more. That, I mean, that's it. Uh, do you have a prescription for Adderall? I do not. When's the last time you and Doug snorted Adderall together? That night before we were going to drive to go to okay. leave the watering hole. When we were about to leave the watering hole and I was going to drive. Okay. He has a prescription for Adderall, and we just, we... Okay, so that was at the house, at the watering hole? At the watering hole, in the parking lot, at the watering hole. Okay. Matthew has admitted that he and Detry took pills that night. The detectives have already suspected this and are becoming increasingly sure that they have the guilty parties in sight. So I just asked you about Doug and you mentioned alcohol, marijuana, cocaine on occasion, and then you specifically said about pills, whatever he does you don't know. Well no, but that's it. He's got a prescription for Adderall. So for Adderall, he's got a prescription to take it, so that wouldn't be he's got one a prescription to snort it. I mean, that, that's, that's abusing it, right? Here's, here's the thing, Greg. There's a lot of things going on right now. What do you know? Tell me what you know. I mean, I know that the police read his house. That they How do you know that? that? It's on the news. We were watching the news in total disbelief that this thing is so, so we're, why would you want to do anything but tell us the whole truth? Because if you're here and you want to cooperate with this investigation and you want to assist and be a good witness, and not get jammed up on all this. I mean, why would you, you, you not tell us you know, the truth about everything? Well, you just lay it all on the table. You skipped Adderall. 
I mean, you, well, you, you had a maybe, prescription, you know. I well, mean, is you, that a thing? That you don't have a prescription to start know, it. You not. gave us very distinct and, and detailed um, information down to the minute. I mean, that's well, a lot of it is in the text. I get it. But but it does matter. When we say every Everything detail matters. matters, when you pull into somebody's driveway and you give this officer the actual address and you specifically detail how a black female went out of the door and then you realize that your friend lived there by such and such a name, he no longer lives there, then you proceed it on, and then this, this detective is asking you specifically what street you're driving on, do you not think, then you're telling me that, well, you know, I was in a much clearer state of mind uh, to provide detailed information on how long we were there as opposed to Doug because he was intoxicated. Well, if we're talking about state of mind, do we not want to know about any drug use? I mean, you told us about alcohol. You told us the last time you had something to drink was at 10 p.m. Then you had a shot over at the, at the uh, 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 sardine can, but you didn't drink before that. So that kind of gives us a, a, a gauge of your level of intoxication. But why would you explicitly... Uh, not mention illegal drug use. I had nothing to do with this. I, I didn't say that. I'm saying to you that I have some concerns. We're tearing apart, you know, my private life. Yes, I mean, I. That's what we have to do. I told you, I. Somebody's that. life has ended, right? Somebody's life has ended. So it's a it's the minimum we can do. It's a minimum we can do on her behalf is ask you private questions. And I'm going to tell you that your timeline seems so abundantly rehearsed, and, and, and you know the reason why I know that? It's because it's nowhere near what you told the officers the first time and the second time. It's just not. For example, I'll give you an example. When did you go see your friend? Before or after you went to the casino? I went after. Well, but you told the officers you went I before. I know. I hadn't slept in like 50 hours. They woke me up. You know, I just woke up, and they're asking me questions. So when I was thinking about that, I was a little hazy about what at what point I stopped at Marcus's house. I told him that he wasn't there either. And then I looked into my text, and then I remembered, oh, shit, yeah, he was sleeping on the couch. I brought in that Burger King. You know, they just woke me up. So let me tell you this. One of the craziest moments of my entire life. This detective and I combined have approximately 30 years of doing this job. And... We can tell the difference between somebody not recalling something. I am telling you the absolute truth. Greg, you're, I, you're I interrupting me. Yeah. Just listen to what he's saying for a second. You're interrupting me. I didn't I, say you were lying. I said I can tell the truth when somebody can't recall something or when somebody's providing fabricated information. I haven't even identified which one you're doing. And you're already sitting there telling me you're denying that that's what you're doing. You see what I'm saying? I can understand not knowing what you did one, two, three days ago, especially when you have alcohol and maybe some other controlled substances in your system. I get that. I understand that. I couldn't tell you what I had for dinner three nights ago. Okay? But that's not the story that we're getting from you right now. The story we're getting from you right now is extremely clear and concise, down to the minute, covering a period of 72 hours. It's, it's unheard of. I would actually expect you to remember less than what you remember. All of these events have been going through my head over and over and over for the last 72 hours on a non-stop loop of everything that happened. I mean, that's why I remember all these things, because I am in, you know, this last grade, let me tell you, 72 hours have... Here's what's not going to change. As the detectives press harder, Matthew becomes more tense and defensive, unhappy that his personal life is being scrutinized when he knows that he had nothing to do with Vander Hayden's death. All the forensic data in this case, all of the cellular phone data, all of the tracking of devices, all of the surveillance footage of every business and every street, all of the communication before and after all this happened. Do you think it's an accident that some, certain things were done in a certain way in this investigation? No. So what we're doing is we're sitting back and we're not guessing. And as, the, as this investigation takes us, where it takes us, it takes time to process this forensic data. It takes time for a crime scene and a crime unit to process it all. 
scientists, doctors. We have upwards of 100 people involved. This is a serious, serious matter. It is a homicide investigation. Someone is dead. This person is someone you say is your friend. Okay? So here's the other part. Doug is providing a story. Doug is with us. I mean, so that's kind of a big deal, isn't it? Right now, he's with us. I know. So what I would like you to do is be honest with us now. Because there's two types of person, Greg, and this is, this is the honest to God truth. There are cold-blooded psychopaths, and there are things that happen, there are mistakes that happen. Okay? Yes. And sometimes people get caught up in shit because of loyalty or friendship or because they didn't even know what was happening until it was too fucking late. So the, the time to be honest with us is right now. Honestly, I had absolutely, absolutely nothing to, to do with what? What did you have nothing to do with? Anything to do with What did you have nothing to do with? Do I did not see Nikki again after she left the watering hole. I absolutely did not see her again. So what did you not do to Nikki? She left the water. I have no idea. I have no idea what happened to her. I, I did not. Well, you already, I never never already contradicted again. yourself. I would like to leave. I just. If you're free to leave any time, I want, right? have nothing to do with this, guys. When you do get through all this, David, what's your story? This door is open. So right. we'll see you. When you're free you, to walk out this door whenever you want. What you will I'm see here to have you cooperate. You the investigation. Well, no, but now you're you starting. You're accusing me. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm telling you the facts of the well, facts, my friend. Listen. Matthew is on the verge of leaving. It is his right to do so. But some people have a hard time following through because they believe it may make them look guilty. They're going to take when us all this forensic it. evidence gets finished, you are going to under know that I had absolutely nothing to do with any of this. You're going to see that my timelines are correct. I've been thinking Did you have about this. At all? I mean, I don't know. I had some conversations with her at the watering hole, but that would have been the only place. Yes, we're kind of packed together. We're trying to be close to the front of Steel Panther. You know, I, I, there's possibility, but no more contact than just our arms Wait, brushing you each other. Are you talking right now? Yeah, I mean... So nothing more than that? No. I mean, nothing more than, you know, if I saw her on the deck and she didn't see me and I said, Hey, Nikki, uh -huh. you know, that is it. That is all. Would you be willing to provide consent for a DNA standard? I already did. I already did all that already? Yes. I already consented. They took swabs out of my mouth. I did that on Saturday when I came to pick up my and car. And you provided sent consent for your phone as well already? Yes, I did. And my car, yes. All three. So do you feel like you've done everything and, you can to and my this investigation? Well, I didn't wash my clothes. I was going to do my laundry last night, and I did not wash my clothes because I had the feeling that they would want my clothes, and if that could help. So I didn't do my laundry last night. So that we, And then they came at 11.30, and I immediately gave them all of the clothes that I had been wearing. What and the shoes. All, what were you all wearing that night? I mean, a red shirt, tan cargo pants, and sandals. That's what I was wearing. And I gave them all those things. Did you have an undershirt at all? Yes, I had a white, like, white beater undershirt because the shirt was kind of, if I moved my arms, my shirt would come up over my stomach, and I didn't want to midriff when I'm standing at the concert. So, yes, I did wear a white shirt tucked into my pants. And the sandals you said you were wearing? Yes. And that's? I gave that, yes, okay. the boxers. What about your glasses, the same glasses? I was wearing contacts that evening. Contacts. Yes. Okay. Any type of jewelry, necklace? Nothing. No. What did you all have on your person? I mean, I had my phone, my oh, wallet, cigarettes, wallet, lighter. Cigarettes. What kind of cigarettes do you smoke? Camel lights. Always. Yeah, Camel Blue ninety nines usually. Camel Blue ninety nines. Yeah, if, if it's seventy five cents off, I'll get you know I might get mm -hmm. the shorts over the over the ninety nines. What were you smoking that night? I think I had, I think I had 99s. 99? Yes. Okay. Greg, we just told you that, that Doug is with us. Why do you think he's with us? Because he's her boyfriend. Awesome. You obviously found something at his house, you know, I mean. Well, what could have we possibly found at his house that would cause Doug to be with us? I don't even want to imagine right now what. I want you to imagine. You know why I want you to imagine? I want you to imagine on behalf of your friend, Nikki. I tried to help you guys as much as I can. I've been thinking about this timeline for 
the last 72 hours trying to make sure that I knew every single possible detail of everything Nikki your friend? we did. Yes, she is my friend. She you is. Have Nikki. She is. She is okay, my friend. On behalf of Nikki, can you tell me what you could possibly think that we would have found at his house that would cause Doug I mean, to be with us? I have no idea. I would hope that he wouldn't have been able to find anything at his house because I would imagine, I would hope that he had nothing to do with this. You know? Well, I'm going to disillusion you of this of your friend that's been your friend for almost 20 years that we did in fact find physical evidence. What do you think that we found? I have no idea. I have absolutely no idea. What? Well, would, would you be shocked that we found physical evidence? I mean, I guess I would be shocked. I'd be shocked that one of one of your friends that you've been friends with your whole life, that you thought was a good person, all of a sudden gets arrested, you know? What kind of evidence would shock you? When searching the house, the police found a pair of Air Jordans with smudges and blood on the soles that looked like they might have been related to the marks on Vander Hayden's body, indicated that she had been stomped on. There was also blood in the garage and Vander Hayden's car. However, the smudges in the car later tested negative for blood. The blood in the garage wasn't human, and the blood on the shoes didn't belong to Vander Hayden. Any kind of evidence? Well, I mean, evidence could be anything. What kind of evidence would be shocking to you? That we might, we I mean, you finding blood would be a shocking piece of evidence. That would be shocking to me, yes. That would be shocking. Blood where? Anywhere. Anywhere you'd find it, I would be shocked. And that would be it. It's so unbelievable. You know, Greg, unfortunately, I've discussed this matter with my partner here, Zach, and we've looked at the just miles of information that we're having here, and, and uh, you know, I, I hope you don't think that I'm bullshitting you that Doug is, is in custody with us, okay? Uh, and, um, you know, we really, we really believe that um, whatever the issue was with Doug and Nicole that night, I don't think that it was pre-planned. I don't think it was something that was malicious. I don't think, I, I really think that Nicole was out of control that night. She was highly intoxicated. Definitely. And she put herself in a, in a position of vulnerability. You know, she was, she was acting the fool. I mean, no doubt about it. I just okay? can't imagine hurting her. I just can't. And, and what I'm going to tell you is, is, is I really don't think that, not only do I not think that Doug um, wanted this to occur, but I especially don't think that you wanted this to occur. I mean, that's that's just the bottom line. And I think just based on your proximity to Doug, based on your proximity to Nicole, and based on your proximity to, to the people involved, you just got to be in a bad spot. And I really would hate, I, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here and for continuing to voluntarily be here because I really truly believe, and, and Zach shares my opinion, that that you are that witness that can speak on behalf of your good friend. Unfortunately, sometimes witnesses, as you're maybe feeling right now, can yes. easily and quickly turn into a person of interest. And we don't want that to occur. We want the, the information flowing from you to be willing and voluntary, and we want it to be full, okay? Eat no matter how hard it may be. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm going to tell you that there's no doubt in anybody's mind that the evidence shows that your friend, Doug, had involvement in her murder. There's no doubt about it. Okay? But what I'm telling you is you don't want to get yourself in a position where you go from a person that, that can assist by, by giving some, some, some peace to the family to somebody that's a person of interest. You don't want to you don't want to jump that line. After the watering hole that night, I have never I never saw Nikki again. I I I never saw her again after the watering hole that night. I Do never you understand saw that even if your I phone runs out of battery or even if it's turned yeah, off, I mean, that's not uh, let me finish what I'm trying to say. That'll exonerate me from having any well no. Well, it actually puts you. Right. In, actually, I, I think I'm ready to leave you guys. Free to I leave wanted to help you, you, but you're trying to play this game and accuse me of something I had absolutely 
nothing to do with. I never saw Nikki again. I left the house while Dallas was the babysitter was still there. Her vehicle was in the driveway when I left that house and went back to my house. My parents were home. They know that I was there the rest of that night. Dallas was still there. When you see so video, who can the video for you for the hour before you came to to see Dallas. When you see the you video, did. the video cameras from the bank. You when just ignored my question, right? You just completely ignored that's my question. That's what I'm saying. Who can vouch for you for the 60 minutes before you showed up and made contact with Dallas? Who can vouch you for that? What is the 60 minutes? One hour. I'm asking for a one hour period of time. Who can vouch for where you were if your phone is dead? Thank you, guys. So nobody. That's your alibi? I Nobody. That's your alibi. Your alibi is the guy that's in custody for murder. You'll see the time. Your line. alibi is the guy that's in custody for murder. That's what you're going to walk out this door with? You will see the timelines when you review the videotapes and see where my car was at each one of those. The days. evidence isn't going to lie. Not it is what I know. It's not going to lie. That's why when you see that, there is not this 60 minutes that I have to prove it. They will so see what happens when, we, when, Doug, when we leave that bank? What time that was at? 2.15, we leave that bank, it takes 30 minutes to get to Doug's house, maybe 25 minutes. We get there at 2.40. There isn't this hour of time that you're talking about. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Chris, why can't you, why can't you wrap your mind around the idea that, that we have a bunch of evidence here? Nikki is dead. And, and your alibi, your alibi, I could, but when you are dog, starting, that's it. when you are starting to accuse me of being involved in this in any way, and they want, they want to accuse you of being involved. Yes, you are. You're telling me, oh, it'll make you feel better if you tell us the truth. I've been telling you the truth. I've told you the truth every moment that I've talked. You, you haven't been. considered. You haven't considered another thing. You haven't considered that maybe you didn't have any involvement in it, and maybe Doug disclosed something to you. Doug disclosed nothing to me. He is kept to his innocence every single time I've talked to him. There's been nothing he has said to me that would indicate to me that he had any involvement. So if he's in custody for murder then, then he's being framed. That's your position? If Doug was involved in something like this, would he tell you if he had any involvement in it? Then he better not, because if he told me he had any involvement in it, I would tell you guys immediately. Because I, I have good people that I'm friends with, good people, honest people, Friends that I've been friends with forever because we've all been good to each other forever. And if I ever thought that Doug was capable of doing something like this, he would never have been a friend of mine in the first place. If I ever found out that he did something like this, he would never be really? a friend. Really? He's of never heard a woman before? And you don't know really? this? No. And then the next girlfriend that he was with, I would grill her. Is he ever doing any of this shit? Do you shit? know Rebecca? I know Becky, yeah. Oh, yeah. She told me today he broke her leg and she covered yeah. for him. Kind of a big deal. I know. She made that claim. So it shocks you that Doug would do anything. So then, I, so then she's a liar when she made that claim? She is a little crazy. She is. And when she and when, when she I talked to Danielle, Danielle told me, you know, that Doug never physically abused her. I that I talked he to her. He broke her leg. Danielle, this is not Rebecca. Yes, this Rebecca. Is girlfriend. Who who what what broke Rebecca's leg? She fell down the stairs, supposedly, I know. And you buy that? I know. You buy that that his ex girlfriend fell down the stairs and got a broken leg? I think that he would not have been capable of doing something that stupid. Well, yeah, but what does your what does your cognitive mind tell you? What does what does common sense tell you? Becky was crazy. I did. Okay, know so Becky. Rebecca was crazy. That so when she when he tried like, to break up with her, his family has money. So when he tried to break up with her, she tried to go after him, thinking she could get something out of the family. That's what she did. That's when she that's when she filled out those reports. Tell me this: Why didn't the police? Arrest up for that because she filed the police report and they decided that she was not. Is that what that's Doug told you? <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's what I thought happened. That's yes. I mean, is that what Doug told you? That is what he told me. Would you be surprised if he didn't tell you the truth? I mean, would that surprise you? No, it wouldn't. So it would not surprise you. It wouldn't Doug surprise me if he kept it private and lied to me about that. Even as he is going out the door, the detectives try to get him to say something incriminating about Detry but they are grasping at straws. Yeah, so don't let your friend paint you into a corner here. When you get all the information, you will see that I have nothing We're getting information from Doug. And when, and, well, and he it knows I have nothing to do with the two. Doesn't so, mean he has to say that. All right, guys. I tried.
The DNA on Vander Hayden's sock wasn't a match for either Detry or Matthew. Instead, it belonged to George Birch, who met Vander Hayden in the sardine can. When the police were able to obtain Birch's cell phone information, they struck gold. The GPS placed Birch at the bar, Vander Hayden's home, and the field where she was found. Birch was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. He pleaded not guilty. The jury found Birch guilty after three hours of deliberations. Since Wisconsin doesn't have the death penalty, Birch was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, there is a Patreon link in the description where you can support the channel further. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one.